time now to talk politics. I'm joined by John Burris and Jessica Deloach Saban. They are talk business and politics analysts. And you're looking very smart in your smart glasses there. Smart Jessica. glasses. It's good. Smart glasses. All right, I'm coming to you first, Mrs. Saban. Yeah. We have got another Democratic defection in the state legislature. At the national level, you've got Democrats in disarray. Vincent Salaco stepping down at the state Democratic Party. Are Democrats in disarray in Arkansas? Democrats are in transition in Arkansas. Transition. They are in transition. They are still learning what it means to be in the minority, but you can only learn that for so long. There comes a point where you've got to get it together. You need to get your message airtight, and you need to move on and find out why you lost as badly as you did during the election cycle and find a way to reach out to voters and, and touch them where they are instead of just keeping on doing the same thing. Now that said, yes, disarray, you can make an easy argument for that, but remember, the Democrats did win the popular vote. I know that that's a tired argument, but it does count. You don't need to go changing a lot of things. You need to embrace what worked, but you need to take the time to discover what didn't work, and I think that there's a pretty hefty list of that. I'll let you answer at the national level, but I want state level there, because they've also Democrats in the minority yeah. in the House of Representatives. Are they in disarray or are they in transition? Hey, Jessica had her coffee and her glasses, <laughs> and she's spot on. I mean, it's hard to disagree with that. Uh, you know, disarray is a, a big word. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think the popular vote argument is a little bit fair, uh, not, not in Arkansas, but nationally at least. At, at least it should prevent Republicans from getting too cocky. Uh, and so uh, one or two points in a couple states and we would not be where we are. So people would be saying we're in disarray. Statewide uh, or in state politics, I, I, it's hard to say anything other than it hasn't gone according to plan. Even after the election, you've had three Democrats in the House switch. Right. Uh, you know, guys who said in 2010, 12, and 14 did not switch parties and, and now decided to. There was a lot of pressure then. They withstood the pressure. They switched now. I think if you're the, a state Democrat, you've got to ask, what are we doing wrong? Because uh, they stuck with us for a long time. And so it's going to be a long climb out, but uh, you know, it, it, things, things change quickly. All right, sticking with you, John, here. You've got uh, super majorities in the House, a uh, super majority in the House now for the GOP and a near super majority in the state Senate. Are the GOP majorities in the legislature going to make it difficult for Governor Asa Hutchinson to govern, particularly where do you park bad legislation now? Um, I, I have a lot of confidence in the legislature and, and the process. It'll work itself out. I think it probably means that he needs to govern conservatively. You know, probably one of the biggest fights you're going to see is over the tax cut policy. He announced his package last week. There's probably going to be some conservatives that say that's not, you know, what we want. They want something more focused on the, a top rate reduction, which the governor has also stated as a goal. They so. You're going to have some give and take, but you know you always do, and that that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it, the increased number in the legislature is probably a harder on the speaker and the pro tem and the respective majority leaders. For the governor, if you use it right, it can be you know it can be a good bargaining chip and help him get things done. Yeah. You don't have to resent it. What do you think, Jessica? I think this is uh, one of the things that Democrats seem to be excited about. So think about this. <laughs> that, that they're in the minority? <laughs> yes, embrace it because everything that happens belongs to the GOP on a state level, nationally, it, it's all theirs. So when they do something great, give them credit. When they don't do something very well, take note and think about how you could have done a better job. I mean, they're, they're the ones driving the bus. You're along for the ride. What Democrats need to do, though, is be very, very smart about how they engage when there may be some contentious votes or some split votes because they are going to be expected to do what's best for the people of Arkansas. But let's not forget, we're talking about a political party. They do have their own interests, and you're probably going to see them holding out on a few things here and there. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But at the end of the day, the people in Arkansas matter. Okay. we got to take a quick commercial break. Jessica and John will be with us when we come back. Stick around. And we're back to talk politics. I'm joined by John Burris and Jessica Deloach Saban. All right. The Russians are coming. They're here, actually. Uh, we have seen a lot of national news in the cycle this past week. You guys both tweeted about this, and so I'm going to pull up some tweets that you guys said here. Uh, John, you said you kind of view this Russian hack as a final showcase of Obama arrogance. Jessica, <laughs> you said, how do you square knowing your candidate and party received help from a nation that doesn't share your values? So, yeah. John, I'm going to ask you Jessica's question. How do you, how do you square that? I don't think anybody does. I mean, Russia is bad. I hope they didn't try to hack 
or you know, we'll see what happens as a result. I, I don't think it's necessarily news that they were tr trying to interfere in our process, and if they did, they should be held accountable. You know, I'd point out a couple things. One, uh, Donald Trump's tax returns were illegally accessed and then released to the, to uh, to a news news organization. It dominated a month's worth of headlines. Democrats cheered. Illegal information is illegal information, whether it was a leak from the IRS or if it was a foreign nation uh, hacking partisan entities and sharing that information. I'm not shocked because, and, and the last thing I'll say actually is that this is a little bit hyperbole, but I think it's fair. Democrats are more outraged over Russian uh, action on Hillary's emails than they are about Russian aggression in Aleppo and Syria. At least that's the way it seems. This was the second time Russia has, I saw your reaction, I'm sorry, but I think it's fair. I, Ru Russia has been violating lots of red lines sure. and lots of things that the president asked them not to do. And and this is, a, I'm glad the Democrats are finally tuning in. Jessica, I'm going to let you respond before I throw sure. a burst question at you. Go ahead. That's fine. I mean, you want to talk about being concerned about Aleppo. You want to, you want, you want to talk about being concerned about Syria. How about this? Donald Trump stays up all night and tweets can't find the time to even begin to talk about Aleppo, but guess who he could meet with the other day? Kanye West for a photo op. He can complain about what's written about him in major publications. There comes a point where you need to lead, and I think, you know, you've been elected. You're probably going to be confirmed by the electors. Why don't you just go ahead and get started on your job since you wanted it so badly? The rest of the world is watching, and right now they're not impressed. All right, we're going to bounce off of this and go to something else. Donald, Trump, uh, Donald Trump's been making cabinet picks. I want you to each give me your best and worst Donald Trump pick. I'll let you go first. His best? His best. Do you know I'm surprisingly not too bothered about Rick Perry? Okay. I'm not, I, because I do believe in giving people a chance. I really do. And I, I think that, yes, he's had some gaffes, uh, several Oops. of them. He you know, I can't remember which agency <laughs> I want to eradicate. Well, you know, oh, I... <laughs> right, give me a job in the one I want to get rid of. That's right. great. But uh, worst? Where do I begin? We could start with Rex <laughs> Tillerson. I'm perfectly fine with going there just because he does have ties with Russia. We're talking about a person who led Exxon for, what, 41 years? Or he was involved with He's Exxon involved, for 41 years. I'm sorry. Long. He didn't lead it that yeah. long. <laughs> Congratulations to anyone who would do that. But he was involved with Exxon for that long, which means not only would he have dealings with Russia, but he also has dealings in the Middle East. And that includes a lot of the unsavory locations in the, in the Middle East. That's not the person that I would want in that position. All right, best and worst. Uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, Education Secretary. Best, yeah, best, okay, best absolutely okay. the best. <laughs> the most likely to reform uh, what needs to be reformed. Mr. Pruitt, the Attorney General from the EPA, Democrats kind of flared up, but he wants to undo Obama's EPA. That's a lot different from uh, criticizing the EPA and its role. So those are the two best, I think. Who's the worst? I don't have it necessarily seen a bad one. one. All right, all right. Look, I got to end it there, but we're going to go online and talk a little bit murder, uh, further. So we're going to do a web extra if you guys will stick around. Yeah, okay. sure. All right, John Burris, Jessica Deloach, Saban. Uh, check us out at talkbusiness.net. When we go off the air here, you'll see the whole extended interview, including the web extra. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Roby Brock. We'll see you next time. And welcome to our Web Extra. I'm Roby Brock. We are hosting our Talk Politics uh, Roundtable. We did a little Web Extra with Jessica Deloach, Saban, and John Burst. We didn't have enough time on air. We never have enough time on air when you guys get here. You guys mm -hmm. get into the feisty mode. But <laughs> All right, so we were talking about, uh, before we went off air, we were talking about um, cabinet picks, best and worst. You didn't never give me a worse one, but I'm going to cut you some slack on that one. Okay. Let's talk about what happens with health care in a new Trump administration. John, you're the healthcare guru. Mm -hmm. You're one of the architects of the private option slash now Arkansas Works. Uh, what's gonna, what do you see happening with the new landscape? Well, I, I think that states should lead the process. I don't think states should wait for Congress. Waiting for Congress is never really a good strategy. I know there's a lot of expectation from people that, you know, Congressman and now Director Price or, you know, Paul Ryan are gonna lead the way and I think that those guys are competent and very likely will but I don't know why a state would wait so states should lead and I think that whatever plan they put forward shouldn't be based on the principles of Obamacare and you know what I mean by that really a couple things one it shouldn't the real the principle of Obamacare was Medicaid it was coverage through Medicaid coverage through Medicaid through enhanced match rates and so 
I think Congress has said that the enhanced match rates are probably the first thing on the chopping block, as they should be. That doesn't necessarily mean funding. It doesn't necessarily mean dollars to states to offer coverage. But the dollar shouldn't be through Medicaid, and the dollar shouldn't be uh, through some enhanced match rate that really doesn't offer the state the incentive to control costs. And so I hope that states lead the way with kind of with asking for options for coverage, because people have said that is the goal, but coverage not through Medicaid, not through simply enhanced Medicaid match rates, and most importantly with, with uh, things like work requirements. We've kind of been beaten down to think that when you say work requirements, you know, you can't even talk about it. There ought to be real work requirements. If you don't work, you shouldn't get premium assistance. You've still got to do some things that's going to require federal uh, assistance. I mean, you've got to do something that's going to allow federal permission, I guess might be my, my yeah. better point of doing that. You can't sell insurance across state lines right now. It's, it's not legal. Yeah. So. Um, these things about states leading, there's going to be limitations on that, is there not? And I think people should, states should push the limitation of CMS's state innovation waivers. That states, it, we shouldn't wait for, comp, for, for years we've talked about states leading the way, state innovation, state flexibility. We've caught the cars, much as I hate that metaphor, deliver. Put something on Congress' desk, put something on HHS' desk, and show them what you want. Don't wait on Congress to give you the next Obamacare or the next plan, or certainly don't wait on Congress to solve the problem. You wanted flexibility, make them give it to you. Sounds like a guy running for Congress, doesn't it? It so, does. Know, so. it does. Or Definitely HHS director. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Do you think that uh, Arkansas works, the private option, Medicaid expansion, do you think it's dead in Arkansas as a result of this? How's no, it going out? I think it's too soon to say, but I definitely think that Arkansas is in a better position than, than a lot of other states. Um, I do think that we have elected officials here who are very committed to making sure that people do receive care. It's really a question of how many can receive it and, uh, and how good it is for everyone. I mean, it's expensive. So we've got to find a way to take That's care right. of it. It's expensive because of the mandates on QHPs, that, on health plans that Obamacare mandates. Ask for exemptions to those and design our own health plans. Fix the problem. Don't wait on Congress. All right. I asked you guys to bring a prediction to the table here today. So we'll wrap it up with this. Jessica, I'm going to let you go first. Give me your top prediction. Okay. Well, I think the top prediction going into 2017 would be the Democrats do come to realize the position that they're in. And I think they start finding their footing. I think that it, they have a grand opportunity to elect new leadership for the party nationally. I do think that the person that they elect to that position for the uh, for the chair of the party, that will all trickle down. That leadership does trickle down because, you know, right now, a lot of states are without leadership on a state level. And so we're one of those states and we need to figure out what our future is going to look like. Um, and I also have a Christmas wish. Yeah, go ahead. My Christmas wish would be <laughs> that President-elect Trump makes infrastructure his top priority when he goes into office. I think that could be good for the entire country. I think it's good for him politically and it's something that we desperately need. Well, he watches this show and he'll tweet about it, so Mr. we'll President see. President-elect. <laughs> John. I think Trump's first 100 days are gonna be more successful than certainly most people think and probably more successful than any first 100 days we've seen in quite a while. Uh, maybe even actually rivaling uh, Barack Obama's first 100 days. All right. Okay, those are good predictions. I'm going to throw two of them out at you, one state, one national. Number one, I think you're going to see more Democratic defections at the state legislature, whether it's uh, session-related or post-session. I think you'll see that happen. And I'll go out on a limb. I think Rex Tillerson, who you were talking in the break, is probably not one of your top picks for Secretary of State. I think he sails through the confirmation process. I don't uh, even think there's a speed bump to slow him down. I don't disagree with that one bit. All right. <laughs> John Burris, Jessica deloach Saban, as always, we appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching our Web Extra. You can keep up with the latest business and political headlines each and every day at talkbusiness.net.